Good morning, and welcome to our Good Friday worship service here at Northwood United Church. My name is Reverend Scott Turnbrook, and on behalf of the community of faith here at Northwood, located in Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, we welcome you. We welcome you to this gathering, this challenging day throughout the entire year's trajectory of our faith. I think Good Friday is the most challenging day for us to come to worship because it touches the depth of our humanity, what we are capable of, and where God will meet us right here. This evening we gather, this morning rather, we gather around the day that Jesus was crucified when his friends all had denied him, rejected, and he hangs upon a cross. Yet we find that even here, even at this time in the depths of our humanity, God is still here, working to redeem our humanity, meeting us in the depths of our brokenness, working to bring us home. And so thank you for gathering, for gathering on this very important part of our faith, for this is a day that assures us that God meets us here here in the darkness, in the shadows, and that's why things are a little bit darker around us today in the service. I mentioned uh, in the uh, communications earlier in the week that people are invited to have a, a nail, something that they can ponder as the meaning of this service progresses. If we were able to gather in person, we, we would even take part in interacting with the cross, with the nail, but today I'm just going to invite people to hold it to feel it, to think about the meaning of that today. So if you have a nail, if you have a screw, something tangible that you can hold on for this day, I invite you to do that today. And so welcome. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that you have braved the depths of your faith to know that even here, in the darkness of our humanity, in the depths of our pain and our suffering, God meets us here. So come, let us worship God on Good Friday. We gather in the shadows of this day, the day that the sky turned to darkness. We gather knowing that God meets us here. Let's join together in prayer. Merciful God, you did not spare your only son, but indeed you offered him up for all, that he would be touched by the darkness of our humanity. Grant us, O oh God, the space this day that we might so deeply examine ourselves as we realize the darkness present in our world, the darkness present in ourselves, a darkness so great as to spiritually crucify then and now. Help us as we gather, O oh God, to recognize the nails which we drive into the cross today. And as we recognize them, allow them to so transform us into more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. We 
we're holding in our hand a nail. What does a nail mean? Well, for some of us, it's a, an object of construction, something that we build good things, homes, chicken coops, all the like. But we also remember that nails were used as instruments of torture. Back then, the Roman crucifixion was a method that they used to intimidate anyone who would consider breaking the law. Crosses were constructed at all of the entry points for Roman occupied cities. And upon those crosses, criminals would be crucified, nailed to the cross, and they would die a slow, painful death as their hands were pierced, as their sides were pierced, their feet, and as they would slowly die. Crucifixion is not for the light at heart. It's a symbol and a reminder of the depths and the darkness of our humanity. But it's also a reminder as we notice the cross becomes empty in our faith. A reminder of the power of God at work. A reminder that God will go with us to the depths, the darkness, the pain. But that God will also overcome and bring resurrection and hope. We need to go through today in order to move towards Easter's sunrise morning. And so we hold these nails in our hand. A reminder of the pains that are inflicted then and now. And a reminder that God meets us here. And indeed, God will transform all things for good. Our first reading, as we go through the various readings, considering nails and how they use to harm others. It's read by Emma. Emma's going to read a passage about the nail of pride. Emma from Mark chapter 12. The first reading is the nail of pride. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. As he taught, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues, and places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearances, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. The Nail of Pride Friends, would you join with me in the responsive meditation, inviting your response in the bold print. 
O God, help us consider our own pride and where it leads. O God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our pride hurts us and creates walls between us and others. O God, we know too that our pride hurts you. The next reading comes from Rod. He's reading the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, the nail of betrayal. This is reading number two, nail of betrayal, Matthew 26, verses 47 to 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one who will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say, it must happen this way. At that hour, Jesus came to the crowds. Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Nail of betrayal. We join together in the responsive meditation. Oh God, help us consider how we betray others, how we abandon them in their time of need, how we think of ourselves first. Oh God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our acts of betrayal hurt us and create walls between us and others. O oh God, we know that our betrayal hurts you. Deborah Richards will offer the next reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the nail of envy. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? 
She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is from those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The nail of envy. you join me in the responsive meditation? Oh God, help us consider how we envy others, how we desire more than we receive, and seek to influence and rule over others. Oh God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our envy hurts us and creates walls between us and others. Oh God, we know too that our envy hurts you. Emma Dick will offer the next reading from Matthew chapter 27, the nail of indecision. Reading number four, the nail of indecision. Matthew 27, verses 20 to 24. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. The Nail of Indecision
Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Let us join in the responsive meditation. Oh God, help us consider how we waver, how we seek to avoid responsibility and to blame others for our actions. Oh God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our indecision hurts us and creates walls between us and others. Oh God, we know too that our indecision hurts you. Rod Carter will offer the next reading, The Nail of Cruelty, from Matthew chapter 27. This is reading number five, The Nail of Cruelty, Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 31, and verses 39 to 42. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns, thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe, robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. The Nail of Cruelty Let us join together 
in the responsive meditation. O oh God, help us consider how we are cruel to others, how we begin to malign and slander others and add to the evil that comes upon them. O oh God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our cruelty hurts us and creates walls between us and others. O oh God, we know too that our cruelty hurts you. The next reading is from Deborah Richards, The Nail of Hatred, from Luke chapter 6. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those for whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. The nail of hatred. We join together in the responsive meditation. Oh God, help us to consider how we show hate to others, how we fail to care for others and make distinctions among them. Oh God, do not let us deceive ourselves. Our hatred hurts us and creates walls between us and others. Oh God, we know that our hatred hurts you too. Will you join with me in a word of prayer? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be ever and always acceptable unto you. For you are our rock and our redeemer, our alpha and our omega, beginning and our end, the source of our love, and a wellspring of our joys. Amen. Today's a holiday, right? I mean, we can't get our mail. We can't go to the bank. Can't get our cars fixed. I suppose there are some people stuck at work, but for most of us today, this is a holiday? If you're new to attending church, if you happen to just pop online and take in a service, 
see what this church stuff is all about on Friday, you might be surprised at how we Christians spend Good Friday holiday. And for many Christians, many choose actually to forego this holy day of Good Friday and skip right on to Easter's glory. On many Good Friday gatherings, a good seat can always be found in the house, at least back in the days when seats and pews were there for gathering. We could actually come to church. But for you, you have come. For you, this is a significant part of your Holy Week, the sacred time, the most sacred week of our year. And you know, you know the spiritual truth, don't you? You know the truth that you cannot fully arrive at Easter Sunday without going through this day of Good Friday. So why have you come? What draws you and your soul to engage this holy day in the depths and the darkness of this day? For as we've heard, as we've heard the nails, each of the nails being driven into the cross, as we're reminded this is not an easy day to come to church, why do you come today? I think it might almost be easier for us to answer the question of why we don't come instead. We'd prefer, most of us, we would prefer to avoid this day. One reason that keeps people away, I think, as I ponder it, is because to gather this day means something. It's to acknowledge and be touched by the toughest parts of our faith. Now, five days ago, Palm Sunday, you remember Palm Sunday? Palms and towels in our hands, waving a parade of hosannas, welcoming, shouting church goers, welcoming Jesus. And Easter, in just a few days, in just a few days, we'll have us singing our hallelujahs, wearing our Sunday best. And yes, you can wear your Sunday best, your Easter hats, and whatever is your Sunday best, even if you're staying at home for worship. But Friday, Friday has a cross. Friday has a cross with the nails of suffering. Friday does not seem good by any stretch of the imagination, so why would we ever come? I think the difficulty for us to get the significance of this day is summed up so well in Mark's gospel. There's a section that contains the dialogue between the two brothers, James and John, and their friend Jesus. Mark 10 records it like this. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come forward to Jesus, saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in all your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I baptize with? The question that Jesus asked, the question that draws us here or keeps us away is summed up in those very words. Are you able to drink Jesus' cup? Are you able to be baptized with Jesus? Baptism. Well, we answer, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I like Christmas. Now, that is a wonderful story. No room at the inn, but God provides a manger. A murderous Herod, but God protects the Holy Family. I like Jesus healing. I like Jesus teaching. I like that hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know. I like all of those things. I like the palm procession last Sunday. And of course, well, Easter this coming Sunday, that's my favorite Sunday of the year. We always go for brunch afterwards and we we love to hunt for Easter eggs. Today, 
But today, Jesus asks his friends, are you able to drink the cup that I drink, to be baptized with the baptism that I offer? Well, I guess when I think about that question, I'm just not sure. Unsure, yes, but you have come. Perhaps so many stay away today, for they already know what James and John in the story have yet to discover. The road that Jesus is walking is a road that leads to his pain, the road that leads to his torture, a road that leads to his death, his death on an old rugged cross. The cup that Jesus is to drink is the cup of suffering, the cup of his horrible death. The baptism that will drown him is the baptism of his death. The suffocation upon a cross will end his natural life in, a, in order to allow glory for the future to arrive. The disciples show that they do not understand, so why should we? Reading further in the story, they respond to Jesus' question saying, sure, we can do that. We're able to drink the cup. We're able to be baptized with your baptism. No problem. This is the message I sometimes wonder that modern day followers of Jesus seem to proclaim to the world. Perhaps because we're reluctant to hear this message ourselves. Because Jesus is not a technique. A technique for getting we what we want out of God. Jesus is God's way for the world to come a little bit closer, closer to God's way. God wants a world to resemble a world made whole. God wants a world to resemble a world that is redeemed, restored, united, and including all. And the way that God will get that is with ordinary people like you and like I, Willing to walk with Jesus, talking with Jesus, and yes, even if need be, suffering with Jesus. Many of you will likely, especially on the West Coast, be familiar with a physician by the name of Gabor Mate. He chose to run his medical practice for the residents of the downtown east side of Vancouver, which appallingly is the poorest area of all in Canada. In Matei's book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, Matei reflects on the necessity of the word compassion. Compassion, he reminds us, is made up of, of two roots, calm, meaning with, and passio, Passion, suffering. Compassion is the act of suffering with. And compassion is that necessary part of living our lives. In his practice, Matei treats many drug addicted people. And through the offering of the essential ingredient of compassion, he seeks to heal them. He treats people who have suffered horrific acts of violence. And with compassion, he heals them. He treats people whose lives resemble a living hell. He offers them compassion as they heal. Compassion, Gabor Matei preaches, is a necessary part of healing for all of his patients. And compassion, Jesus teaches, is a necessary part of healing in the world. Somewhere along the line, people have adopted this misguided belief that because Jesus suffered, we will not have to. Let's be clear on Good Friday. As Jesus willingly takes that cross, it does not put an end to suffering. Jesus on the cross is God's promise that no one will need to suffer alone. Yet as his followers, we will suffer. As his followers, we follow the way of Jesus, which does include suffering. And as we find these times of deep suffering, we will know that Jesus suffers right along with us. 
compassio, compassion. Jesus is suffering right along with you in your pains and your struggles. Jesus is there. One of the most moving passages of Jesus' compassion for me, I find contained in John's gospel. It's the shortest verse throughout all of the gospels. Coming there out of the tomb of Lazarus, his good friend who had died, Jesus' first action, it says two words, Jesus wept. He cries, he suffers, he shares his pain. Before he goes on and heals and rises, raises Lazarus, it says Jesus was deeply moved in spirit. It reveals that Jesus had a depth of compassion for Jesus to us reveals a God who suffers along with all those who are in pain, who are broken, who are hurting, who are suffering. Jesus reveals God's compassionate love for all of creation. There's a lot of talk about love and the Christian faith. Many might wonder where love fits in on a Friday that we dare to call good. Jean Vanier is the founder of the L'Arche community, and he explains love in this powerful way for us on Good Friday. To love someone is not to do something for them, but rather to reveal their beauty and their value. Jesus' suffering reveals a depth of love that is almost unfathomable for us. Jesus' suffering reveals our callings to bravely look at our crosses, our crosses in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our world, and to look for those crosses and how we might also serve. Jesus' suffering reminds us that as we find crosses to bear, that we will not bear them alone. Jesus will suffer with us. As we so bravely live out our faith, it causes suffering and sacrifice. Jesus' suffering reveals your beauty. Jesus' suffering reveals your value as your suffering and sacrifice allow God's kingdom to gradually unfold through you. Jesus' suffering reveals to us that Jesus suffers. He suffers along with those who follow his suffering path on the way to the glorious resurrection for all. To be sure, the path of Jesus is windy and confusing. We know where it leads, yet we wonder how we will one day ever arrive. That's why I think we need to stop, stop and ponder the depths, the confusion, the pain and suffering of this day. We need to stop at Good Friday, for this is a day that begins the waiting, the hoping that one day, that one day as we look towards the waiting, thy kingdom will come. Andre Dumas wrote in his novel, The Count of Monte Cristo, that until the day when God shall come to reveal the future of all humankind, all human wisdom is summed up in two words. Wait, hope. Wait and hope. And so, my friends in faith, may we have the faith to truly wait and hope at the foot of the cross. My patient pilgrims, may we wait and hope here with nails in our hands. For we know that God is indeed doing a new thing. Let us wait and hope, knowing that God suffers along this road that leads towards the new life in Easter that will come. On this Good Friday, may you be blessed in this day of darkness, knowing that Christ suffered knowing that we are God's suffering servants who walk the light of God's grace and that we do not suffer alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, we join together in our time of prayer, a time to truly open up our hearts to God, a God who suffers with us. Let's join together in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for the grace of this day. That we come to a deeper understanding of knowing that you suffer with us. That you meet us in the pains of our living. In the inflictions that have been offered. In the pains that we cause. That you meet us here fully in order that we might fully be redeemed. Oh God, we, we have pondered the nail of pride and give thanks that you have met us here. Oh God, we have pondered the nail of betrayal and know that you have met us here. Oh God, we have pondered the nail of envy and have found that indeed you meet us here. Oh God, we have pondered the nail of indecision and found that even here you meet us. Oh God, we have pondered the nail of cruelty and found that even here you meet us. And finally, oh God, we pondered the nail of hatred and found that even here you are to be found. And so we wait and we hope. We confess the darkness of our humanity, of ourselves and, and of all the world, yearning for you to shine light in the darkness. In the original Easter story, they waited three days, from Friday until Easter sunrise morning. We are a people that wait and hope for the continuing of your light the redemption of your humankind. And so we continue to wait and hope, not passively, but also actively, that we might live our faith and know that you suffer with us. And indeed, we do not suffer alone. We take an opportunity now in silence, O oh God, just to share with you our private prayers so we pray for the pain and the brokenness in our lives and in the world. As we wait and hope, we thank you, O oh God, that you meet us there. And so we would now share that prayer that you teach us to pray together. And if you're watching this on our Zoom worship gathering, I'd invite you to turn your microphone on so that we have an opportunity to hear one another in prayer. What a beautiful community act of faith. So you can just turn your, your audio on and that'll come right up on your screen. And so we continue in prayer, offering the prayer that Jesus taught all who follow, praying for thy kingdom come. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The nails have been placed upon the cross. 
symbols of the darkness of our humanity, the pain and the suffering that is felt, the pain and the suffering that is offered. And we find this day that indeed Jesus suffers with us. Our God meets us here fully in the depths and in the darkness. As the shadows gather, we're reminded that indeed God is here with us. As we wait and hope, we know that God is here with us, yearning to redeem our very nature. And so let us go forth with the hope that is found even in this day. This day that Good Friday, when God would make it good, God's Friday. And so go forth, knowing that even today, God created you in abundant love and seeks to redeem us. That Christ will transform even death, death on a cross offering us all new life. And the wind, the spirit, the breath of God will guide us this day and every day towards that day. Let us go forth now and always in peace. Amen.